Welcome back to Real Talk with Susan Stone and Christina Supler. We're full-time moms and attorneys bringing our student defense legal practice to life with real conversations. Today's topic is really going to be a very emotional topic today. It's, we're here to talk about the fentanyl problem that is really impacting the health, welfare, and lives of students across the country, students and adults, but our practice focuses on what's happening with all students. Susan, over the years in our cases, we've represented students across the country, and I think we regularly see that, particularly college students, experimenting with drugs and alcohol, it goes hand in hand. And while some students, I don't know, I guess can handle it, I think we also see a lot of students who really struggle with the substance abuse and don't recognize all the dangers that can go hand in hand with ingesting various substances. And I think in particular, one thing that we regularly see is sexual assault cases. Correct. We see, and we've talked about this on our podcast, a real uptick in mental health issues. And I don't want to say every case because that's not accurate. But I think we can fairly say that most cases that we deal with, whether it's about sexual assault or any other form of student misconduct, somewhere in the picture is a use uh, or misuse of alcohol or drugs. We hear often from the students we work with that sometimes there's substance use or experimentation with drugs for numbing and students just exploring life. And, and that's really what brings us to our topic and our speaker today. So Susan, why don't you do the introduction? We're here with Dr. Beth Weinstock, who created an organization called Birdie Light to spread awareness about fentanyl use and this crisis that we have of students dying from the use of fentanyl. Dr. Weinstock, welcome to our show. Can you please just highlight what led to you creating your organization? Sure. Thank, and thank you so much for having me on your podcast today. I live in Columbus, Ohio, and I'm a mother and a physician. I have four children. My second oldest child, Eli Weinstock, was a sophomore at American University. And on March 3rd of 2021, he took or experimented with some substance, a pill or a powder, we're not sure. And he collapsed and died in his off-campus apartment in Washington, D.C. I'm so sorry, really. Thank you. Thank you. He was not struggling with addiction. He was, you know, what our organization now likes to call an experimental or recreational substance user. We were devastated. There's really not a lot of words to, to really explain what happened in my family. But six months later, my daughter, Olivia and I, she's 22, and a recent college graduate decided to start an organization called Birdie Light. And the purpose of our organization is real simple. We just get in front of young adults, age 15 to 25, and parents, and we educate on the dangers of fentanyl, where it's found, how to avoid it, how to test for it. We are now four months old, and the momentum is enormous. We really have found a niche and a real need in this crisis in our country. And we aim to, to educate every young person in America about this crisis. I think for, for a while now, families have heard on the news stories about the opioid epidemic. And there have been many stories about fentanyl and its dangers. However, I know Susan and I, from the conversations we have with parents, it's pretty interesting how many parents don't know what fentanyl is or just have a belief that only certain populations would face the dangers posed by fentanyls. Oh, it would never touch my child's life. Beth, can you speak to what parents should know about fentanyl and why it's so dangerous? Absolutely. So I think 10 years ago that maybe that misconception would have some truth to it, that 10 years ago, fentanyl was mostly found in heroin. And mixed with heroin, there are lots of people addicted to heroin who would periodically get fentanyl in their drug supply. And as time went on, more and more fentanyl was found in heroin. And, and now nearly all heroin has fentanyl in it. As a parent, it's easy to say that happens over there. That's not my 
kid, that's really a, a hardcore addiction situation that is not touching my family. Well, what happened about maybe three years ago is that you started to see fentanyl infiltrating the drug landscape in, in so many other ways. So you started to see it in methamphetamine and then methamphetamine overdoses. Well, they're called methamphetamine overdoses, but they're actually fentanyl poisoning. Those started to increase. And then soon after that, you started to see it in counterfeit pills that were labeled as oxycodone, hydrocodone, Xanax, Adderall. And none of these pills were real. They weren't exactly what they said they were, but they were fake pressed pills that had fentanyl in them. And that only started a few years ago. And that coincided, of course, with the start of the COVID pandemic. So it didn't really hit any parent or student's radar that this was happening because it was happening in real time with the COVID pandemic. And so all of a sudden you're hearing of these young, healthy individuals dying who didn't have a substance abuse problem, who weren't using heroin, and we're just now catching up. And a lot of parents don't know this information. When we think about recreational use of drugs in college or high school, I have to be honest with you, I still think of alcohol and marijuana. And can you talk about what are the other drugs that students are experimenting with that we as parents should say, we know you could go a party and you might encounter X? Because I guess I don't think of Xanax or Adderall as a recreational drug and we have cases where that's come up, but could you speak to what's really happening at parties? Well, I think there's two ways to talk about that. One is is not at parties. So for example, if a student, particularly a college student, wants to stay up all night and study, that student might ask a friend for an Adderall to be able to do that, that stimulant effect that they're looking for. So that's not necessarily a party drug. But what might happen is that student might say, uh, hey, do you have an Adderall I can use? But it's not really an Adderall. It was pressed in some guy's basement to look like an Adderall and it has some fentanyl in it. The other part of that might be the Xanax, the fake Xanax that a student is struggling with anxiety and wants to get some Xanax off the internet or through Snapchat or on TikTok. And they get a Xanax, not to party really, but just to manage some anxiety. So that's that environment. But if you go to parties now, I mean, this is the word on the street. I don't have real numbers to back this up. But my understanding is that cocaine has made a huge comeback. It's not at the level as it was in the crazy 1980s, but it's here. And lots of kids are experimenting with cocaine. So all of those situations are spots where a kid could be poisoned by fentanyl. I think it's interesting, the comment you've just made, the example with Adderall, for example, and students who are up late studying, finishing a paper, seeking that stimulant effect. And I think it's important for parents to recognize that because so often parents have the the mindset, my child would never fill in the blank. But in reality, the dangers of fentanyl aren't just tied to recreational drug use. It, It can be students using drugs for other reasons that have nothing to do with being at a party and being social. So thank you. I I think that was a really poignant example. Tell us if you could please a little bit, from what I understand about Birdie Lights, the goal of the organization is harm reduction and helping keep young adults safe. And so tell us more about what Birdie Light does to get closer to safe. Yeah, and thank you for using that phrase. We like to repeat it many times, closer to safe, because we know that inherent in the act of taking a pill or using cocaine, you're never 100% safe. There's risk inherent in any drug experimentation. So we tell students we want to move you closer to safe by, number one, our education. We talk about fentanyl in a real sort of in-the-weeds way. We talk about how it's found in cocaine and what pressed pills look like and what to do if you're going to use ecstasy at an outdoor music concert. I mean, we really get in the weeds with this. Then we talk about what fentanyl does to your body and, and how it can be reversed by Narcan because it is an opioid. It's a synthetic opioid, but it's still an opioid. And then lastly, we talk about fentanyl test strips and we pass them out to students and to parents. 
And what we do is we teach them how to use the test strip and we talk about how to use it with each type of drug. And then they leave wherever we are in front of them as speaking, we leave them with test strips or information on how to get them. I want to circle back to something that Christina brought up. My child would never. And that really resonates with both of us because what you wouldn't know, Dr. Weinstock, is that we travel all around the country talking about sexual assault and prevention of sexual assault. We actually hear it from both sides. We hear parents tell us my son would never violate issues of consent. We hear us Parents of daughters saying my daughter would never put herself in a position. And we've had a lot of pushback over the years in our endeavor to say that we deal with this every day. How do you at Birdie Light deal with the blinder issue or the just the prevailing attitude out there that, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry that must have happened to you. I'm going to put my head under you know, a rock because it couldn't happen to me because that dissonance Every day we hear it. Every day we hear it. And it's so hard for us to be, we've changed our talk a million times and we still run against that same wall. I love that question. And there's different ways in which we've run up against that pushback. One of which is I find that when I talk to people about Eli and as soon as I bring up the word fentanyl, there's a stigma, right? And so the assumption is that Eli struggled with substance abuse and opioid substance use disorder, and that would never happen to my kid. The first thing I try to do is to talk about fentanyl in a way that reduces that stigma. I don't know if I could ever get rid of it completely, but I try to stress to parents particularly about the numbers. And I always use comparisons because it works. I tell people at the height of the AIDS epidemic and the worst year of the AIDS epidemic, we lost 50,000 people to HIV. Just last year alone in 12 months, we lost 100,000 people to opioids, over three quarters of which were due to fentanyl, okay? So I try to do comparisons. I say on the entire Vietnam War Memorial Wall in Washington, D.C., there's about 50,000 names for an entire war. And so what I try to stress is that this is not a substance use disorder problem. This is an American problem. And it's going to affect you one way or the other. You're going to know someone, and God forbid it ever happens to you. I never thought it would happen to me. But we all know someone who's been touched by this. So I try to reduce stigma initially. And then I also try to quote things. I try to tell parents, listen, I've been to schools and I've talked to students, college students particularly, and I ask them, do you know someone or have you seen someone trying cocaine or have you yourself tried cocaine? And one out of three kids say yes to those answers. I'm not saying one out of three are using. I'm saying that they've been near or have seen cocaine. So one out of three. So we're looking at an opportunity not just to educate kids who may never use drugs, but also to educate the ones who are using. So if a parent says to me, my kid would never, I say, but your kid might never, but your kid might be in a room where they could save a life. They might be in a room where they see a pill or some powder and they could say, hey, wait, guys, before you do that, let's test it. So that I think that reaches parents if their kid can be the one that saves a life. The idea of students of all ages perhaps being in a setting and even if the student, him or herself, doesn't experiment with substances at all. This idea that you've mentioned about seeing others who are engaging in snorting cocaine, for example, let's just say. Let me ask you, I I wonder, because teenagers have developing brains, teenagers can be spontaneous, especially boys, often we see them with ADHD. After hearing the message of birdie lights, are young adults or students really, are they pulling out the test strips? Do they actually think to use them before injecting, snorting, consuming any type of drug? Well, That data on the ground is hard to gather and and us being relatively new, we don't have large numbers just yet. We have anecdotal reports. We do know that four girls who were about to use ecstasy at a a music concert did use our strips and found fentanyl and threw their drugs away. I do know that some boys that live on campus at OSU called me and said, can you bring us some strips because we're going to do coke? And I brought it to them. I do know that 
we do surveys to every group we speak to and the students always say as they're leaving, we do our anonymous survey and say that they plan to change their behavior based on what we've told them. But the data gathering is hard. On our strips, we have a QR code that says in a really like uh, pleading way, if you use this strip, please fill out our survey because we need to know if what we're doing is working. And that data is real small. It's rare that a college student would stop and fill out a survey as they're about to test or use drugs. But over time, we hope to gather more and more data in the moment. You know, just anecdotally, I can only speak to the students we have spoken to. And the truth is they're scared. They know that this landscape is is a minefield and they're scared and they want our strips. They want our education. Are we going to reach everyone and have them change their behavior? Probably not. But piecemeal, we hope to go one by one, save as many lives as we can. Have you received any pushback? I'm thinking about your story about someone from OSU calling you asking for a strip because they're doing cocaine, saying that rather than giving them the strip, you should have said, don't do the cocaine. I haven't received pushback in that scenario because I'm dealing one-on-one with the young adults, but I've received a little pushback from high schools and high school administration in the sense of asking me, how do we tell kids just say no to drugs at the same time we're telling them how to test their drugs? My only answer really is that the numbers don't lie. You know, data doesn't lie. And if this many kids between the age of 15 and 24 are dying, then our message isn't working. Our message of just say no to drugs is not working. There are lives being lost. And I try to point out to administrators that I can tell young adults not to use drugs because of the inherent risk. And I can tell them Eli's story. I I had the biggest risk, the biggest loss. And I can say this is what happened. My son also received the message for years of just say no to drugs. So the numbers don't lie. And I know that's one of the, the fears of high schools that we're sort of giving a mixed message. But I think it's okay to give both of those messages in parallel. We work a lot in parallel because our practice primarily focuses on sex issues. What are you going to do? Tell kids not to have sex in college. And Christina, how many times do we deal with kids who are high and having intercourse and or drunk and then saying they were incapacitated? Yeah, I think that's actually a very good analogy, Susan, that might hit some of our listeners as frankly bizarre. But I think the reality is with substance abuse or sexual activity, We have good feedback from our practical experiences in our cases. Beth, as you point out, look at the data and the numbers on fentanyl. Don't do it. That strict prohibitive message just doesn't seem to be working. And so the question is, what is the message that we should be advancing to our kids to help keep them safer? I suspect many of our parents and listeners might really say, wait a minute, this birdie light, is it in fact promoting drug use? But I think it, it's really important that parents think, really think about what your message is, Beth, at birdie lights, and then also think about their own children and their own life experiences and just reflect. And I like the idea of the language getting closer to safe, because I think it's a concept that has application to so many different issues that high schoolers, college students, young adults face. My thought is that we're also facing a mental health epidemic that we've never seen. The Surgeon General just put out an advisory that we are in a national health crisis when it comes to mental health. And I guess, Dr. Weinstock, I would like an opinion as to our students with mental health issues not properly being medicated. And with that alleviate a need for students to turn to something like street Xanax if their anxiety and depression were being addressed properly by more healthcare practitioners. Absolutely. I, I, I work in healthcare, so I see the deficits when it comes to mental health support, access to care. And, and of course, it's geographic. It depends what area of the country you're in or if you live near a big medical center. Wait lists are so long right now. So we have an access to care uh, problem. And obviously, this has been an ongoing debate, but we have a in health insurance problem in our country. So this mental health crisis 
is a big one to tackle. But I, I do want to point out, though, that I do not advocate in any sense that a young adult take a medicine or a pill that they weren't prescribed, such as a Xanax, an Adderall, a Percocet, hydrocodone, oxycodone. There's no way that that's a good idea. As we know, you should only take pills that have been prescribed to you and put in a bottle by a pharmacist. However, I want to point out that an intelligent kid can learn either through their own parents' use of pharmaceuticals or on the internet that a person who takes a Xanax or an Adderall or a hydrocodone or oxycodone is not going to die. So let's say I'm 15 and I'm so anxious I can't go to school in the morning and my friend gives me a Xanax they got off the internet. You can research that online and learn for yourself that if I take a Xanax, I'm not going to die. That's the difference, is that we don't just have a sort of uh, recreational drug use opioid problem. This is a poisoning problem. So what alarms me about this situation is that we can solve the mental health crisis in incremental doses, which is, you know, such a big thing to tackle. But if you're the risk is so vast, if you're just going to take what you assume to be a legal prescription pill that by itself has never killed anyone, and you're going to die from that. I mean, that is a risk model that is, is catastrophic, right? So we're not just dealing with an opioid substance use crisis in our country or a mental health crisis. We're dealing with a poisoning crisis. That's the alarming thing. Poisoning, referring to the fentanyl. Tell us a little bit how the test strips work in conjunction with a substance there might be a pill or something that's snorted. How does one use these test strips? And does it work with injectable drugs? It will. It will work with anything that is in liquid. So basically you have to take a part of the cocaine you're about to use and dissolve it in a little shot glass size uh, container of water. And you can dissolve it and test it. There's very specific instructions. For example, if you have a bag of cocaine, you should test it multiple times before you use it because the fentanyl can be distributed in different parts of the bag. If you're about to take a pill, you can dissolve the pill in that water and test it with the strip. And then you actually drink the, the water, you know, because it's a pill, it's going to hit your stomach soon anyway. So it's okay to drink it. That way you test the whole pill and not just a segment of it. And then you can also... For example, if you're cooking injectable drugs, you can take some residue off the cooker and put some water on it and test that. So there's very different instructions for each drug. And when I speak to students, I go into those specifics. For example, I haven't gotten in front of a big high school system yet, and there's some pushback there on discussion of the test strips in detail. So perhaps for a high school audience, I wouldn't get into details on how to test your cooker, the residue on your cooker. There, You have to know your audience. So I tailor what I speak to regarding what group I'm in front of. Right now, I mostly speak to high school students in small private groups rather than in front of a big auditorium. Well, we'd be quite a team. You talk about drugs and we would talk about sex. I think we just need a musician to talk about rock and roll and <laughs> trifecta. What about Narcan? I have to tell you, I asked Christina this morning, my vision of Narcan was from like bad 70s movies of someone ODing and them like pl plunging an EpiPen. Is that still what it is or has it evolved? Oh, so much. I mean, Narcan is so widespread now and so easily used. It's it's a nasal spray, at least the kind you would get for use out in the community. It's an easily oh, used nasal spray. That's what Christina said. My go-to source <laughs> for everything is my law partner. And correct me if I'm wrong, just I think this is useful information for our listeners as well. Most communities have public health departments where one can obtain Narcan for free, correct? Or is that something that only... You don't have to be an EMS worker or law enforcement to have Narcan, right? No, no, you can get it in, in any pharmacy without a prescription. It's a great active citizenry to carry Narcan with you. And a lot of college students do that. They pass out Narcan on college campuses. And you'll talk to some students who say, well, I carry Narcan. I don't use any substances, but I carry it with me just in case. It's really 
a life-saving tool. And if you're going to be at a party where people are using drugs, I would talk to all of your kids, have Narcan, know where it is. And one of our goals with Birdie Light is to make Narcan and fentanyl test strips so commonplace that it just seems like it's the first aid kit in the hallway closet. You always know where the test strips and the Narcan are. And if every college campus, every dorm, every fraternity sorority had these two tools just sitting there for use, and it was common conversation to learn how to use them, the lot number of lives that would be saved would be remarkable. We had the privilege of watching your interview with Jake Tapper. You did an amazing job, Dr. Weinstock. We learned that Kratom was also found in Eli's body. I, did, I had confess, I didn't know what that was. Can you discuss that? Because my understanding when I did a little bit of research is that it's a, a legal substance. It is, yeah. Kratom is an herbal supplement that's legal. And Eli had two substances in his system. One was Kratom and one was fentanyl. I don't know any more than that. So, for example, I try not to get too sidetracked on the Kratom issue because the number of people that die from Kratom ingestion and fentanyl is minuscule. And so really focusing on that would take a lot of attention away from the vaster crisis, which really has not a lot to do with fentanyl. But either Eli took some Kratom that someone along the way had laced with fentanyl or Eli was given a pill that he thought was something else, either a Xanax or whatever he thought it was. And instead of having those ingredients in it, it had kratom and fentanyl in it. But he, with his pathology, only had two substances in his body, kratom and fentanyl. But we just don't know the vehicle as to how he ingested it. Well, that was my thought. Are, are people putting fentanyl in vitamins or something else. That I was actually just thinking as I was listening, I think we, we represent a lot of college athletes. And at various times, we've had students who have hit different bumps in the road with, with student disciplinary proceedings because of essentially bodybuilding drugs and stuff that has been ordered off the internet from overseas. And they think they're getting one thing, but it's a powder and who knows what's in it. Would these test strips perhaps be a good idea to use with something like some sort of supplements that's ordered off the internet or something like that? Again, just to make sure that it's not poison. We were mind melting there because we had the same question at the same time. There's no data or research to say that that would be useful. It's not something that's been reported that bodybuilding supplements would have fentanyl in them. I would say that Anytime you order something and you're not real clear on where it's coming from or who's regulating it, there's always some inherent risk. One of the problems would be, for example, if you got a bodybuilding powder and it was a jar, like a large jar, is how would you test it? The fentanyl is lethal at such a small dose. And so a large jar of powder or protein supplement, you would have to check the entire jar and that would take lots of strips. So I guess I can't speak to it because it's not an issue that's come up or something that's ever been recommended. I would say that a grain of fentanyl that's like a grain of sand can be lethal. Is that correct? Well, it's a little more than that. Like if you took a salt shaker and put enough salt in your hand to fill the very center indentation, they say 12 to 15 grains of salt, that's a lethal dose for most people. The lethal dose is a little different if you're accustomed to opioids, if you take them frequently. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Have a quick question about the name Birdie Light. We couldn't help but notice that Eli's name is almost in the middle. We see the E-L-I. How did you arrive at that name? Well, we came up with some other like generic sounding names like Save One Life and that kind of thing. But we wanted it to be more personal. And Eli's buddies in eighth grade, uh, they had a, a band of boys that ran around and they called themselves the Birdies. I don't know the origin of that, but it was always very cute. And then at his memorial service, a bunch of those boys, men now, wrote uh, letters on the tables we had spread in our backyard. They wrote letters to Birdie. So we thought we would use that. And also at the same time, I started thinking about a bird and the canary in the coal mine concept of how the canary went down to to test the air first in a coal mine. And, and I thought of that as the test strip. You know, the canary in the coal mine. Our logo has a yellow bird with a canary, I'm sorry, a, a miner's lamp on its head. 
And um, so we called it Birdie Light. And I'm not really making this up at all, is that we looked at Birdie Light after we wrote it down. And then we said, wait a minute, Eli's name is in the middle of it. And so it was just serendipitous. We had a couple of people say, you should change your name because Birdie Light doesn't say what you're doing. Yelp and Uber's name doesn't say what they're doing either, but the name means a lot to us. To our, our listeners out there I, who can't see my face, I, I think that the hair on the back of my neck was just raised and I, I'm stopping some tears. That is stunning. And don't you change that name. I, I don't get a vote, but if I did, that is really compelling. Thank you so much. This has really been incredibly informative. And I think that you've shared a lot of really important information that our listeners can reflect on and then have conversations with their own children. So thank you so much. And to our listeners, thank you for listening to Real Talk with Susan and Christina. If you enjoyed this episode, please do subscribe to our show so that you never miss an episode and leave us a review so that others can find the content we share here. You can follow us on Instagram. Just search for our handle, Stone Supler. And for more resources, visit us online at studentdefense.kjk.com. Thank you so much for being a part of our Real Talk community, and we'll see you next time.